Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, today's lecture will be on ergogenic aids and how they relate to skeletal muscle metabolism and uh, athletic performance. So as always, a couple of quick announcements. A reminder that I've extended the due date for case study number two. It's no longer due Friday, March 20th. It is due next Friday, Friday, March 27th. Again, submit this by 11.55 p.m. If you have any questions regarding the assignment, please don't hesitate to reach out. And as you guys know, as it relates to COVID-19, lecture content will be only offered through online format for the rest of the semester. This isn't a big deal for us since lecture capture has existed this entire time. But just note that the ergogenic aids lecture today, environmental stress, as well as the final exam review will only be offered through this lecture capture format. Additionally, stay tuned for information regarding the final exam. I've decided to follow a 48 hour take home exam format, uh, likely involving some kind of study design and critical thinking analysis. There is a poll posted on Sakai um, right now to determine the examination dates. Please take, a time, take the time to vote on this as I would much rather have you guys choose the dates as it relates to your own personal schedules and uh, the latest changes you may have received in terms of assignments and examinations during this period of time. Course evaluations, they open uh, Friday, March 27th. I'm gonna ask you guys to please take the time to fill these out. Um, it's really important to me that you guys give me feedback, good or bad, as it will allow me to shape the course in the future as I hope to teach it again next year. And I'd really like to make some changes that will be beneficial for future students. So please take the time to do those course evaluations. Today's lecture, as always, we start with an introduction to the topic. So intro to ergogenic aids. The ergogenics that we'll be talking about are creatine, beta alanine, beetroot juice, pyruvate, and a little uh, sub-side side note on carbohydrate mouth rinsing. So an introduction to ergogenic aids. What are ergogenics? So they're techniques or substances used for the purpose of enhancing athletic performance. This can be either from a men mental or a physical standpoint. It's any competitive edge over your opponents. What's important to know is that um, the use of ergogenic aids is widespread across athletes of all ages and even around the world. So statistics that support this are the idea that over 85% of athletes surveyed use ergogenic aids. And the statistic holds true for young athletes as well. So athletes under the age of 18 are even known to use ergogenics. For the purpose of this class, we'll be focusing on nutritional ergogenic aids that influence skeletal muscle metabolism and are safe to consume. So really, again, breaking that down into its points, nutritional ergogenic aids, so something that we consume orally that can be derived from animals, derived from plant sources, etc. How it influences skeletal muscle, so really thinking about the mechanisms underpinning these ergogenics and that they're safe to consume. So there's lots of ergogenics that we could talk about um, that are actually banned by the World Anti-Doping Association, but we'll talk about ones that athletes and even yourselves can freely consume as maybe it will influence your decision to use or to not use these safe ergogenics. So there's a rich history of the use of ergogenic aids really dating back um, to the first Olympic games where Greek Olympic athletes consumed herbs and mushrooms in an attempt to improve performance. So to get a uh, competitive advantage over the other athletes. Moving forward in history a little bit, uh, in the 1800s, French athletes started making their own ergogenics. So they actually consumed something called Vin Mariani which is cocoa leaves and wine. And what they found was that consuming this concoction actually reduced fatigue and hunger as it related to um, ultra endurance or endurance type events. And of course, uh, with the, the advent of ergogenic aids comes the idea that 
people can abuse the use of ergogenics, um, transitioning to the idea of ergogenics that are not legal for consumption for athletic performance. And really this idea that in 1968, we actually started doing drug testing at the Olympic Games for banned substances and that might be um, used by athletes in order to improve their performance. So how do we know that an ergogenic aid actually works? Um, if you guys are paying attention, this is something that you should put an asterisk on, something that you should consider using for your case study number two. This is a really key point here. So again, how do we know it works? First thing we need to do is know whether it gets into the bloodstream. So if we consume the supplement orally, do we see a rise in plasma levels? And we can take a blood sample to determine this. So for example, if I take creatine, I would hopefully be able to take a blood sample and at some point in time see that the creatine I ingested orally is actually getting into my bloodstream because in order for a supplement to be delivered to a target tissue, it has to be in the blood and that blood has to circulate and deliver whatever nutrients are carried in that blood to our target tissue. In this case, our target tissue is skeletal muscle. So with that regard, can I take a skeletal muscle biopsy and see, for example, that there's creatine in my muscle after some period of time? If my ergogenic aid of interest does not accumulate in the blood, it does not get to my target tissue, there's no way that it can alter skeletal muscle metabolism. And of course, our third parameter is, yes, it can get into the blood, yes, it can get into my muscle, but it means nothing as an ergogenic if it doesn't translate to a meaningful improvement in athletic performance. So what I mean by a meaningful improvement is that a 1% improvement in performance might not mean anything for someone who's completing a Tough Mudder, they're a weekend warrior, uh, recreationally active, but someone who is uh, an elite athlete competing for Olympic gold might value a 1% improvement because it could be the difference between a gold medal and finishing fourth and not even making the podium. So again, something we should consider when we're thinking about ergogenics and how they might influence performance and who they might influence performance for. So thinking about aerobic time trial performance, you guys have seen this slide before. It was in the research methods lecture. It can be measured in a number of ways. First would be a set distance. So how fast can I complete a five kilometer time trial? It could be a set amount of time. How much work can I do in 60 minutes? Or it could be a set amount of work. So standardizing the workload across individuals based on their body weight, you're gonna complete four kilojoules of work for each kilogram body weight that you have. Could also be a time to exhaustion uh, protocol. So exercise until you can't exercise anymore. But of course, we know that we typically see that more in rodent models compared to humans. And that really brings us to this idea that we've discussed before, ecological validity. So that's a fancy term, meaning is the method that we're using to determine performance applicable to the real world? So for example, a five kilometer race, something we typically see, or a marathon, something we commonly see as a race or a athletic event, has greater ecological validity compared to a time to exhaustion bout, which is something we almost never see in the real world. Other metrics for performance. So for example, uh, a wind gate, you guys have seen this time and time again, 30 second all out effort. We can look at mean power. We can look at peak power. That's typically achieved at the onset of this wind gate effort. We can also look at strength measurements like repetitions to failure at a submaximal workload or uh, a measure of absolute strength being our one repetition maximum. We can also look at stop and go sports performance. So things that simulate uh, stop and go sports such as basketball, soccer, hockey, lacrosse. Um, we can actually test this in a controlled manner in either a laboratory or a gymnasium setting where um, we can use tests like the yo-yo intermittent recovery test or the left for a shuttle test very similar to a beep test where we have efforts of high intensity running, recovery, high intensity running, recovery. 
again, to simulate stop and go sports. So the first supplement that I want to take the time to talk about is creatine supplementation and how it influences skeletal muscle metabolism and athletic performance. So before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, take some time to step back and talk about what creatine actually is. Creatine is methylguanidine acetic acid. And really importantly for this course is that skeletal muscle contains 95% of our total body stores of creatine. To put this into numerical terms, about 125 millimoles per kg dry mass is creatine in our muscle. And of that, 7 to 90 millimoles per kg dry mass is actually phosphocreatine. Remember, phosphocreatine is going to be that rapid source of energy um, that can provide fuel, for example, during a wind gate. So high intensity energy as well as at the onset of exercise. Talking about our creatine requirements, so we need about two grams per day. If you consume red meat, about one gram per day is coming from red meat, and that's our dietary intake. The remainder can be synthesized in the liver and the kidney from different amino acids, whether that's arginine, glycine, and methionine. And really the key point of this slide is highlighted in the figure on the right, where Creatine is actually transported into the muscle through a creatine-specific transporter on the muscle cell membrane. And this is transported across or against a concentration gradient. So bigger picture, if creatine gets into our muscle or gets into our blood, it needs to get into the muscle somehow. This creatine transporter can actually help bring that creatine from the blood into the muscle so that it can be stored for use and synthesis into phosphocreatine which is again, our high energy uh, fuel for exercise. So now I wanna take the time to talk about um, some of the theory behind creatine supplementation. So here, what we're looking at is a wind gate. And we're looking at the figure here, it's showing us our average power output during that wind gate. It's also showing us the time course, so 30 seconds, and our oxygen consumption over that 30 second period. So what I really want to highlight here is that a wind gate is very high intensity. To put that into terms that might be more appreciable is that the peak power achieved during a wind gate might be somewhere in the 900 watt to 1000 watt range. This is typically three to four times the intensity at the end of a VO2 max test. So high intensity effort, 30 seconds, you're going as hard as you can. You'll realize that from other classes and this one, that phosphocreatine is going to be that rapid source of ATP for high intensity, so the wind gate, as well as at the onset of exercise specifically. So really what I'm trying to say is that the wind gate is the perfect test to evaluate phosphocreatine utilization um, because it's going to provide the ATP at the onset of this high intensity effort when we're waiting for the glycolytic enzymes for anaerobic glycolysis to kind of turn on and start producing ATP. Moreover, we're waiting even longer for oxygen consumption to rise so that we can use aerobic glycolysis to actually produce ATP as well. So how exactly do we rely on phosphocreatine to provide ATP? That is through something called the creatine kinase reaction, where phosphocreatine plus ADP plus hydrogen ions can form ATP and creatine. So if we think about this from two different scenarios, either exercise or recovery, because this, this reaction can travel in both directions depending on the, the driving forces. So let me explain that. So skeletal muscle contraction drives the reaction rightward. So if we look at the right-hand side of this slide, we can see that phosphocreatine um, forming ATP through the creatine kinase reaction because we know that skeletal muscle contraction increases ADP in hydrogen ions and we have a decrease in ATP because we're using it to fuel our, our exercise efforts and make um, and really kind of drive that muscle contraction. So what we see is that phosphocreatine is going to then be broken down to restore these levels and restore ATP to provide it for our exercising muscles. 
Moreover, when we think about the opposite side of this equation, we're thinking about recovery. So in recovery, the reaction proceeds leftward to restore or resynthesize phosphocreatine. So in this case, we have more ATP than we really need, and we have a reduction in ATP breakdown products like ADP, as well as we have a reduction in phosphocreatine, which was used originally to create that ATP for exercise, meaning that we're going to take that ATP, take that creatine, and we're going to resynthesize phosphocreatine, driving this reaction leftward. So what I want to highlight now is this idea of what happens when we do something like repeated wind gates. So this study took six male subjects. What they did was they completed three wind gates, so 30 second all out efforts. And what they did was they had four minutes of rest between each effort. And what I want to highlight now is how substrate metabolism differed from the first wind gate to the third. So panel A is our substrate metabolism during that first wind gate, and panel B is substrate metabolism during that third wind gate. And you'll actually just eyeballing it see that there's stark differences between the two. So what I want to highlight is that um, during the third wind gate, so panel B, there's less ATP provision from phosphocreatine breakdown after that six second mark. Moreover, what you'll see is that the aerobic contribution turned on slightly faster during that third wind gate. And perhaps the most staggering thing is that glycolysis is relied on much less during that third wind gate compared to the first. And really what I wanna note that this is not due to the fact that there's uh, a limitation to muscle glycogen by this third wind gate. It's more so due to regulation of different glycolytic enzymes and the less activation of glycogen phosphorylase or that breakdown of glycogen. So really what I want to talk about here is that you'll see in that first six seconds is that between the first and third wind gate, that big white space, so phosphocreatine hydrolysis, doesn't really change uh, between the first and the third. And we'll talk about why that is on the next slide. So here, when you're thinking back to this idea of this creatine kinase reaction, so phosphocreatine, ADP, hydrogen ions can form ATP and creatine, or vice versa. And really what I wanna look at is phosphocreatine resynthesis in recovery. So the ability to restore creatine in post-exercise recovery on the right here, we're looking at the first figure with this linear regression, is the idea that the ability to restore phosphocreatine stores is related to oxidative metabolism, meaning that the more aerobically fit you are, the higher your VO2 max, the higher your ability to resynthesize phosphocreatine. Moreover, typically, phosphocreatine resynthesis is really fast, meaning that the levels almost return to baseline in simply four minutes. So thinking back to that last study, that four minute break is enough time to allow for phosphocreatine to resynthesize almost to its entirety, meaning that we can still rely heavily on phosphocreatine for fuel during that first six seconds of that wind gate effort. And remember just again that in recovery, we're pushing that phosphocreatine reaction or that creatine kinase reaction towards the resynthesis of phosphocreatine. So it's thinking about it going leftward. So an interesting question then comes with the idea of if I did a high intensity interval training um, modality, can being more trained in high intensity intervals increase my phosphocreatine levels because I'm really stressing that phosphocreatine system. This study recruited eight males, eight females who were originally recreationally active runners. They did four high intensity training sessions per week for eight weeks. They looked at resting muscle phosphocreatine and glycogen prior to and after this eight weeks of training. And to our surprise, what they actually found was that despite stressing this phosphocreatine system through high intensity intervals, 
training only increased glycogen content, so figure on the right there, but had no effect on phosphocreatine levels. So this is really interesting because we think of ergogenic aids as something that can kind of be facilitated by training or something that can uh, improve with training, but this study shows that even training can't increase muscle phosphocreatine stores. But what we'll see in the coming slides is that we can actually ingest enough creatine supplement to increase our phosphocreatine levels. So kind of an interesting and weird phenomenon for an ergo this ergogenic aid. So again, important things to consider. We ingest creatine orally, so we need to consider first pass metabolism. We know that uh, looking at the digestive system in the top corner there, we ingest the supplement orally, it goes down our esophagus, gets filtered by the liver. The liver's kind of role is to detoxify or remove things that might be toxic to the body. And then we have what remains going through our stomach, our small intestines, and we know that nutrients have to be absorbed across the intestinal wall into our bloodstream. So really, if we take in this creatine orally, there's a lot of steps along the way that could kind of destroy or inhibit our ability to actually see that supplement in the blood. But what this figure really shows us is that a single dose of creatine, so five grams, significantly increases blood creatine levels by one hour, meaning that it accumulated in the blood. So that's our first check mark. And what you'll see is that on this figure, it says one, two, and 17. Those are just individual uh, participants and their specific responses to this creatine supplementation. So it seems pretty consistent that after a single dose of creatine, it peaks in the blood after an hour. So our next question becomes, if creatine gets into the blood, does it get into our skeletal muscle, our, our target tissue? So remember, just because a supplement gets into the blood doesn't mean it's going to reach that target tissue, or in this case, reach that skeletal muscle. But what the study shows us is that five days of creatine supplementation, so what they did was 20 grams per day, spaced out as four doses of five grams, significantly increases muscle creatine, total creatine concentrations at the end of this five-day period. So does creatine accumulate in the skeletal muscle or our tissue to target tissue? Yes. So it gets into the blood, gets into the muscle. We now have reason to believe it may elicit an ergogenic effect, enhancing athletic performance. So here's the study. Uh, what they found was that in nine healthy males, who performed two wind gates before and after five days of 20 grams of creatine per day, spaced out again as four doses of five grams per day. Classic thing where they showed a four minute rest between these two wind gate efforts. What they saw was that creatine, which is going to be our black bars, improves performance due to less ATP lost and better ATP resynthesis in that four minute rest period between the two bouts. So again, here we're looking at peak work as well as total work. So really we're seeing a difference in total work, no difference, no significant difference in peak. So panel B, we're looking at total work and creatine supplementation in the black significantly increased the total amount of work completed in bout one, as well as the total amount of work completed in bout two. And this was attributed again to this idea that there was less ATP lost and better ATP resynthesis with creatine supplementation. So now that we know creatine has been approved, supported as an ergogenic aid, how do we actually take it? Is there some kind of special routine we should follow in order to maximize our muscle creatine stores? So this study looked at 31 healthy men uh, the traditional way to take creatine, and that's kind of been talked about in the previous studies, is that people ingest 20 grams per day for six days. Typically, that 20 grams is divided up into four doses of five grams spaced out throughout the day to equal 20 grams. So what they did was they wanted to look at this 
quote unquote rapid creatine loading protocol. So it's called rapid because we'll see on the next slide, there's a slow method for creatine loading. But they wanted to know whether you could take it for six days, then stop, and if you'd be all good, or if you should take it for six days and maybe have a maintenance dose. So what they found was that in the A panel, so no maintenance dose, just six days, 20 grams a day, there was a slow decline and return of muscle creatine levels back to baseline. However, with this creatine loading and two grams a day of, of maintenance following that first six days, they found that at days 21 and days 35, muscle creatine stores were maintained at the level that they peaked at. So suggesting that in order to maintain muscle creatine levels, we have to take two grams per day for a maintenance dose following that first six days of supplementation. So is the traditional way the only way that we can load with creatine into our muscles? Same, uh, same idea, it took 31 healthy men. Two different things here. So we can either have a rapid loading protocol, which is traditionally seen in literature, 20 grams a day for six days, four, uh, four doses of five grams spaced out. But then they also introduced this idea of a slow creatine loading protocol where they took three grams a day for 28 days. So less, smaller dose over a longer period of time. What they found was that during the first two weeks, uh, muscle creatine levels were higher in the rapid loading group, go figure. But by, the day, by day 28, muscle creatine levels were pretty similar between the rapid and slow loading groups. So piece of practical advice, if you're supplementing with creatine and you plan to do it long term, you can follow either a rapid loading or a slow loading protocol to achieve the same results. Some people opt for the slow loading protocol as um, there have been reports of bloating or um, general discomfort associated with this rapid loading protocol. So the next thing I wanna talk about is the idea of responders and non-responders to creatine supplementation. So the study looked at 17 people, 12 males, five females, and they wanted to see how muscle creatine content changed in these individuals following a 10 day protocol. So 20 grams a day where again, five grams spaced out over four doses. And what they found was that there's massive variability in the creatine increase following supplementation in the muscle. So individuals who had lower starting points typically saw greater increases in muscle creatine, suggesting perhaps that this is a saturable response. So maybe there's only so much creatine that you can store within that skeletal muscle. But really the other bigger picture is that just because your friend is a big responder to creatine doesn't necessarily guarantee that you will be. Or just because your friend doesn't respond to creatine doesn't mean that you'll also not respond. So this is something that from a practical recommendation, you just have to try it for yourself and see if it works for you. So are there any ways that we can augment this creatine um, increase in skeletal muscle? One thing that was investigated was carbohydrate co-ingestion. So 24 healthy young men Five days consuming 20 grams of creatine, again, spaced out as four doses with five grams each. And they were divided into a carbohydrate group or a just creatine group. The group that consumed carbohydrates had 370 grams of carbohydrates per day. And what they found was that the co-ingestion of carbohydrate, so black bars on the figure in the right, improved creatine retention and ultimately muscle accumulation of phosphocreatine. But we need to think about the idea that 370 grams of carbohydrates per day is pretty big. Um, that's equal to five 75 gram oral glucose tolerance tests or seven and a half bagels a day. So really is that practical? Is that something you wanna do as an athlete just to increase these muscle creatine stores that will Increase with a slow loading protocol as well? Probably not. So 
Another group of authors tried to address this practicality issue by looking at the ingestion of carbohydrates and protein in combination and creatine supplementation. So 12 healthy men, four conditions. So they ingested a total of 20 grams of creatine per day as five gram doses, four times a day spread out, either with a placebo with 50 grams of protein and 50 grams of carb with 100 grams of carb or just 50 grams of carb. So what we're seeing here is this idea that the 50 grams of protein and the 50 grams of carbohydrate had the same effect as 100 grams of carbohydrate, but perhaps it's a more practical standpoint, even though we st still see this massive spike in insulin with a large carbohydrate dose. Um, it's more practical because eating 50 grams of protein and 50 grams of carb would be something like perhaps a standard dinner where you would have steak and a Kaiser roll or some kind of bun with your dinner. Um, whereas, you know, upwards of 100 or 300 grams of carbohydrate starts to get into a bit of a lack of practicality. So that's all I wanted to talk about in terms of creatine, one of our proven ergogenics. Uh, now I want to shift gears, focus on something called beta alanine. We'll think about how it influences skeletal muscle metabolism and of course, athletic performance. So as always, an introduction to what the ergogenic is. Beta alanine is actually a non-proteogenic amino acid. So basically it's an amino acid that doesn't fall under the category of non-essential or essential. Um, it is a subcategory of amino acids that are found in the body and play obviously an important role as we'll see in the next few slides. So what's important about beta alanine is that it has the capacity to help synthesize something called carnosine. Carnosine is formed by an enzyme called carnosine synthase. Carnosine synthase takes beta alanine and histidine to form carnosine. And what's really important is that carnosine is actually not directly taken up into muscle. Uh, it actually has to be broken down into beta alanine and histidine through an enzyme called carnosinase in order to be brought across the skeletal muscle by transporters um, and then resynthesized into carnosine. What's important about beta alanine supplementation though is that by providing beta alanine, we can actually increase skeletal muscle carnosine concentrations. And we're gonna learn eventually that carnosine plays a key role in pH buffering and might be again, something that's very important for promoting high intensity exercise performance and mitigating fatigue. So again, just looking at this figure on the right, uh, we consume beta alanine. We know that histidine and beta alanine combine together to form carnosine once they're inside the skeletal muscle. And carnosine is going to be that key player in pH buffering. So you're probably thinking, why would we take beta alanine if we could just take carnosine directly when carnosine is this thing that's going to provide this pH buffering effect? So why can't we take carnosine directly? It's a much slower process. Like I said in the last slide, when we take carnosine, we don't have a transporter for carnosine actually. So on this figure on the right, you'll see that carnosine is actually broken down into beta alanine and histidine. Then there are beta alanine and histidine specific transporters into the skeletal muscle, which then once beta alanine and histidine are in that skeletal muscle can combine together to form carnosine again. Um, so again, it's much slower. It's not as effective as opposed to giving beta alanine directly. So now you guys are probably thinking, well, you said beta alanine and histidine have to combine to form carnosine. Why don't we have to supplement with histidine as well? So remember, again, carnosine is beta alanine and histidine combined. However, evidence from previous research suggests that histidine is never going to be the limiting step in our system. The limiting factor is always going to be beta alanine in the, in the synthesis of carnosine. So beta alanine, if we supplement it, can augment this production of muscle carnosine. 
So what is currency and why is it so important? Again, it's this pH buffering effect. Um, it's important for high intensity activities that generate a lot of lactate. Remember, when we generate lactate, it's associated with rises in hydrogen ions. Higher concentration of hydrogen ions, lower pH, more acidity. This is gonna to contribute to fatigue of skeletal muscle. So really some evidence in the literature from animal models shows us that animals with higher levels of carnosine basically have a greater ability to perform high intensity exercise for longer periods of time. Moreover, skeletal muscles that are fast twitch type two muscle fibers have higher carnosine concentrations than our slow oxidative fibers. So like any ergogenic and any ergogenic you'll ever consider in the future, we have to know, does it get into the blood? So this study looked at six healthy males, took beta alanine, uh, and they tra tracked them over a six hour period following 10, 20, and 40 mg per kg uh, doses of beta alanine. What they found was that supplementing with beta alanine significantly increased plasma beta alanine levels and importantly, there was no change in plasma carnosine levels. So remember, beta alanine and histidine are going to be transported from the blood into skeletal muscle, which they then form carnosine. Carnosine is not formed prior to getting into the skeletal muscle. Peak plasma beta alanine concentrations occurred 30 to 40 minutes post ingestion. And what you'll notice is that um, the dose of 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight, so the open circles compared to the black triangles, the fold change was about sevenfold greater, so a pretty big increase, whereas the black triangles, which is 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight to the open white diamonds, which is 40 milligrams per kilogram, was a much smaller increase. Uh, but nonetheless, the higher the dose, the higher the concentration of beta alanine in the blood. So we know our supplement gets into the blood. Next question, does it get into the muscle? 16 healthy males. What we really had was three different conditions here. So four weeks of supplementation with beta alanine, where our first group took four doses of 800 milligrams per day. Uh, and our second group took higher, even higher doses than that. And our third group was the placebo. So our first group is subjects A, B, C, D, E. Our second groups are subjects F, G, H, I, J. And our third group is subjects P, Q, R, S, T, U. What we'll see is that when they took skeletal muscle biopsies prior to, so the black circles or the black triangles or the black diamonds, followed by sub, um, skeletal muscle biopsies following four weeks of supplementation, so the open circles, uh, triangles, or diamonds, resulted in significant increases in muscle concentration of carnosine for the two beta alanine supplemented groups, so groups one and two. However, there was no significant change, of course, in our placebo group. So this shows us that Beta alanine supplementation significantly increases muscle carnosine. Again, remember that beta alanine plus histidine are transported from the blood across into the skeletal muscle where they combine together to form carnosine. So beta alanine supplementation significantly increases muscle carnosine concentrations. So now that we know that um, Beta alanine significantly increases blood levels of beta alanine and muscle levels of carnosine. We need to consider whether beta alanine supplementation can increase or improve high intensity exercise performance. So this study recruited 25 healthy males. They supplemented with beta alanine or placebo for 10 weeks. What they found was that they performed a high intensity exercise test before, at four weeks, as well as at 10 weeks after supplementation. What they did was they did 15 seconds at 85% of their watt max, 15 seconds at 95% of their watt max, and uh, they performed at 110% of their watt max until exhaustion. What they found was that beta alanine supplementation 
significantly improved the total work done. So basically the time to exhaustion compared to the placebo for this high intensity exercise task. What you'll notice is that on the figure on the right, so the black circle at the top with beta alanine is week zero, open circle is week four, and the open triangle is week 10, that the maximal increase in performance was achieved after four weeks of supplementation with beta alanine and no additional benefit or no significant additional benefit was accrued after that. So four weeks of supplementation, maximal performance benefits achieved. So just like creatine, we need to talk about how we actually take beta alanine and how quickly it actually clears from the system. So this study looked at 31 healthy males. What they did was either put people on uh, one of three different supplementation protocols. So the first one was something called the high-low. So they took four weeks of a high dose and four weeks of a low dose of beta alanine. So high dose was 3.2 grams, low dose 1.6 grams or they put them on eight weeks of a low dose. So this is considered low, low. So 1.6 grams per day for eight weeks straight, or eight weeks of a placebo treatment. What they found was that after eight weeks of supplementation, they then put them through another eight weeks of washout to look at how the beta alanine was actually cleared from the system and how quickly it disappeared. What did they find? So looking at the figure on the right here, they found that both beta alanine supplementation protocols, whether that was high, low or low, low, resulted in significant increases in skeletal muscle carnosine concentrations. That was about a 30 to 45% increase. And what they did find in that eight week washout period with both supplementation protocols is that the washout of skeletal muscle carnosine after beta alanine supplementation is extremely slow. That means that the rate of decay was about 2% per week. So if we did the math, um, kind of followed that washout until it was back to baseline levels, it would take about 15 to 20 weeks for that beta alanine to leave the system. So it really sticks around for quite a while once it's there for that eight week period. Some reasons why people might wanna follow the low, low supplementation compared to the high, low. Well, first of all, you almost achieve the same or similar benefits by taking less, so financial aspect. The second is that a common side effect of beta alanine supplementation is something called paresthesia, which is kind of like a tingling or itchiness of the skin. Um, so obviously higher doses of beta alanine will cause greater sensations of paresthesia. So perhaps smaller doses could mitigate or minimize those symptoms. All right, so this study is really interesting. Um, and what they wanted to look at was trained muscle groups versus untrained muscle groups and how that might influence the distribution of beta alanine in skeletal muscle as carnosine. So they took 35 men, 10 of them were healthy non-athletes, so recreationally active, don't specialize in anything, 10 road cyclists, 10 swimmers, and five flat water kayakers. So what's important about those different cohorts is that the 10 healthy non-athletes, they are not really having any muscle group that's particularly trained. The 10 road cyclists have mostly legs that are trained. The 10 swimmers have trained legs and arms. And the flat water kayakers have trained arms but not trained legs. What this can do is help us distinguish whether the training of a muscle group is related to where that carnosine resides. So what they did was they took pe these people, they put them on a 23 day supplementation protocol with beta alanine, 6.4 grams per day divided over four doses. So you'll see that that's higher than a lot of the other studies we've seen. Nonetheless, what they did was they measured changes in muscle carnosine following beta alanine supplementation in the gastroc, so a leg muscle, as well as the deltoid, an upper body muscle. And what they found which is really cool, is that it appears that skeletal muscle carnosine or the concentration of carnosine in the muscle is related to the training status of that muscle group. So if we look at the figure, what we see is that the black is a non-athlete. So you'll see a negative means untrained for gastrox or deltoid and a positive means trained. So you'll see that um, 
Again, non-athletes don't have trained deltoids or gastrocnemius. Cyclists have trained gastrocnemius but not deltoids. Kayakers have trained deltoids but not gastrocnemius. Swimmers have trained both gastrocs and deltoids. What we see is that the muscle carnosine concentration is always highest in the group with a plus, meaning that if a muscle group is trained, it's going to have significantly higher muscle carnosine concentrations than a group that is untrained. This is really interesting because it seems to suggest that taking beta alanine can be targeted to the working muscle group. So that was beta alanine supplementation. And now we're going to switch gears again and look at beetroot juice, how it influences skeletal muscle metabolism and athletic performance. So beetroot juice, what is it? It's high in dietary nitrate. So from now on, I'll say nitrate, but you'll see NO3 minus. Once it's ingested, once dietary nitrate is ingested, it's actually reduced uh, sequentially to nitrite and further to nitric oxide within the body. What's important about nitric oxide is that it's a potent signaling molecule that it can elicit a number of biological effects. Whether that is improved exercise economy, changes in mitochondrial function, calcium handling, uh, vasodilation, so reductions in blood pressure, um, and other aspects as well. Importantly, nitric oxide is a gas. So the reason that you're probably thinking, why don't we just supplement with nitric oxide? The reason why we supplement with dietary nitrate is that it's obviously a um, ingestible compound that can be, again, broken down to nitrate and further to this gas, nitric oxide. So how exactly does dietary nitrate get sequentially reduced to nitrite and further to nitric oxide? That's through something we call the enterosalivary circulation. So what happens following the schematic along, step one, we ingest our dietary nitrate, we drink our beetroot juice. Two, that beetroot juice contains nitrate. That nitrate, so NO3 minus, is absorbed from the stomach and small intestine. It's concentrated into the bloodstream because of that. And what's important when it's circulating through that bloodstream, going to step three, it's actually going to be sent specifically to the salivary glands. That nitrate is actually going to be excreted through the salivary glands back into our mouth. And we're going to skip over to step five on the next panel, where actually in our mouth, we have bacteria, they're anaerobic, that actually reduce that nitrate to nitrite. So NO3 minus turns into NO2 minus. We swallow that nitrate, that nitrite, sorry, NO2 minus, we swallow it. And we move on to step six, where that nitrite can be reduced to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide can then be recycled between nitrite, nitric oxide, nitrate, nitric oxide. And we can actually elicit these biological effects even at the level of our skeletal muscle. So, kind of touching on the point of nitrate and nitrite in the blood, as with any ergogenic, we need to consider whether it actually gets into the blood. So, plasma nitrate levels increase in a dose dependent manner, meaning the more you ingest of this beetroot juice, the more nitrate that appears in the blood. So you can see from this figure, the higher the dose, the higher the concentration in the blood. Peak plasma nitrate levels occur about one hour post ingestion. Of course, we know that nitrate is important, but it's the fact that we have that nitrate that circles back to the salivary glands. Salivary glands convert nitrate to nitrite. That nitrite can then be converted to nitric oxide and have these biological effects. So we're also interested in nitrite levels in the blood. So plasma nitrite increase in a dose-dependent manner as well. Again, the more nitrate you ingest, the more nitrite you see in the blood as well. Importantly, peak plasma nitrite levels occur about two and a half hours post-ingestion. So this is a little bit longer than nitrate levels. Again, thinking about this logically, we need time for those bacteria to reduce that nitrate to nitrite. So I'm gonna stop here, think about for a second something like a practical methodological consideration. So what about mouthwash? This study looked at 12 healthy, recreationally active participants, and they're in one of three conditions, where they mouth rinsed with 
deionize water as a control, a strong mouthwash or a weak mouthwash, both antibacterial. What they did was they asked their participants to rinse their mouth with their solution for 15 minutes or 15 minutes prior to consumption of their beetroot juice supplementation, which was taken twice a day. And they were also asked to mouthwash a third time before lunch. This was during a six day period. What they found was that they took blood baseline and on the sixth day of supplementation. Interestingly, if we look at our figure on the right here, panel A is plasma nitrite, nitrate, so NO3 minus. Those levels increased in the blood following supplementation over this period, which makes sense because we swallow our beetroot juice, our nitrate levels go up because there's nitrate in the beetroot juice, but there's absolutely no conversion of nitrate to nitrite when we use strong or weak mouthwash that's antibacterial. Meaning that with this mouthwash that's antibacterial, it's destroying the bacteria in our mouth that are necessary for the conversion of nitrate to nitrite. If we don't have the bacteria to do this, we will never get nitrate to nitrite and we'll never have the capacity to have a biological effect on our skeletal muscle, our blood, uh, blood pressure, or anything like that. So really what this is, is it's an experimental consideration. If you ever read a beet reduced paper, you'll see that they don't let participants use gum or mouthwash because it can have enough potential to destroy the bacteria and you'll never see the biological effect that you're looking for. So now that that aside is kind of done, we know it gets into the blood. Does nitrate and nitrite get into skeletal muscle? So this was only recently discovered, so 2019 actually, and this is a paper someone will write a paper summary on. And you'll be able to look at it and something that you guys should be reading the paper for as well. But what they did was they had people supplement acutely, so one time with dietary nitrate, and they took skeletal muscle biopsies from the vastus lateralis, and they looked for muscle nitrate and nitrite levels. Up until this point, we knew that dietary nitrate was able to have some kind of exercise benefit, which we'll see in a couple slides. But we had no proof because of the difficulty in doing these assays that it actually got to skeletal muscle. So this was actually the first time that we've seen nitrate and nitrite levels significantly increase in skeletal muscle following the consumption of beetroot juice. So how does beetroot juice actually improve performance? Um, really what it boils down to is this idea that Dietary nitrate, once you ingest this beetroot juice, it can actually reduce the oxygen cost of exercise. And this is something called improving exercise economy. How I like to think of exercise economy first in a true physiological sense is that, for example, you run five kilometers in 25 minutes. It requires two liters of oxygen per minute to make the ATP you need to do this. Imagine you did that exact same thing, but instead of two liters of oxygen, it only required 1.5 and you're making the same amount of ATP, you're running just as fast, it, everything's the exact same, that would be improved exercise economy. You're using less oxygen or less resources to do the same amount of work or produce the same amount of energy. The kind of uh, other approach or the other way I think about this is like, like fuel economy. So if you're commuting for, um, from Hamilton to Brock, usually requires 10 liters of gas to get there, Imagine you could do the same trip, but it only required eight liters. That would be improved fuel economy, kind of akin to improved exercise economy and the consumption of oxygen to make ATP. So here is uh, some proof that beetroot juice actually reduces the oxygen cost of exercise acutely or chronically, it's been seen in both. Um, and that reduction is typically three to 5%. So you'll see here, this is just a measure of VO2 during submaximal exercise. The white dots are placebo, the black dots are beet reduced supplementation. And you'll see this is steady state submaximal exercise. There is this dramatic reduction in the amount of oxygen that we need to produce ATP at steady state when we consume dietary nitrate, which is really cool. And if you guys are anything like me, you'll probably be thinking beets, skeletal muscle and having a bit of a brain explosion and thinking about how a vegetable can actually 
make us perform better? How do we consume this vegetable drink and how does it actually have this outcome? So there's a couple of potential mechanisms of action that have been previously described. Um, the first is that beetroot juice might change mitochondrial efficiency. So it might improve the coupling of mitochondria. So how efficiently the mitochondria uses oxygen to make energy with the idea that we could use less oxygen to make the same amount of ATP. That would reduce our oxygen cost of exercise. Alternatively, another way we could reduce the amount of oxygen we need to perform the same exercise is by increasing our reliance on anaerobic or glycolytic metabolism. Wind requires much, much oxygen if we used anaerobic metabolism to a greater extent, although this would not really be super efficient for an exercise standpoint. Lastly, we could have a reduction in the oxygen cost of exercise if we have an improved skeletal muscle contractile efficiency. So there's two ways we could think of this. The first is alterations to calcium handling. So remember that uh, circa or the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase requires ATP or energy to reuptake calcium following skeletal muscle contraction. So if we could more efficiently do this, so take up more calcium with each ATP, we could reduce that ATP cost of exercise, making us more efficient. Or another theory that's been proposed is that we know that cross-bridge cycling creates that power stroke that's going to generate our excitation contraction coupling or generate the force we need during skeletal muscle contraction. What's been proposed is that we can generate more force with each cross-bridge cycle meaning that we're generating more force for the same amount of ATP that we're using. So that's where this Bailey 2010 paper really comes into play. This is a pivotal paper because it ruled out which of these proposed mechanisms could explain the effects of beet root juice supplementation. So these authors recruited seven healthy recreationally active males. They supplemented for six days with beet root juice or a placebo. What they did was they measured oxygen uptake to determine if exercise economy was improved. That's their kind of quality control check. They then used that 31 PMRS to look at substrate utilization during a knee extension task. Remember that that 31 phospho uh, MRS can actually look at the concentrations of different substrates uh, and how they change during an exercise bout. So, they measured phosphocreatine, inorganic phosphate, ADP. They also looked at ATP breakdown as it's attributed to aerobic and anaerobic metabolism and muscle pH. What they found was that um, they had a couple hypotheses that could rule out the specific mechanism of action based on their findings. One, if the exercise economy was improved, so reduction in VO2, but there was no change in energy from phosphocreatine or glycolytic pathways, they suggested that this related to enhanced mitochondrial provision of ATP. So enhanced mitochondrial coupling. Two, if they found improved exercise economy, so reduction in VO2, and a decreased reliance on phosphocreatine or glycolytic pathways, meaning the reduced ATP cost of exercise, there would be increased efficiency of the contractile machinery. So they're better able to use ATP to do the work, which would reduce our oxygen cost of exercise. Lastly, they hypothesized that if the VO2 decreased and there was a greater fall in pH, so more hydrogen ions, or increased phosphocreatine use, we would be increasing our reliance on anaerobic metabolism and shifting away from aerobic metabolism. Those were the three hypotheses, and they figured that if one of these scenarios occurred in the results, they could dictate what the mechanism of action for beet root juice was. What they found was that there was a significant reduction in the oxygen cost of exercise, so good, they found improved exercise economy in panels A. And in panel B, they found a decreased reliance on anaerobic metabolism. So we can see that the black dots are... Uh, nitrate and the white dots are placebo. We see that the concentration of phosphocreatine is higher, remains higher in the nitrate group, so decreased reliance on anaerobic metabolism. 
That third panel is also showing uh, ATP use and beet reduced supplementation decreased the total amount of ATP used, meaning that we're more efficiently using ATP to fuel skeletal muscle contraction, meaning the likely mechanism of action was enhanced contractile efficiency to complete the task. So now some considerations that we know the potential mechanism for why beet reduced works. And now we can think about the populations that it might or might not work for. So here we're thinking about trained versus untrained populations. They took 21 subjects of varying training status. So seven low training, so moderately active or recreationally active, seven moderately trained. So um, performing regular training sessions as well as seven uh, high or elite athletes. What they found was they looked at uh, on the right hand side, nitrate and nitrite concentrations. And they found that recreationally active, so the low, as well as the moderately active, mod, had the highest rises in nitrate and nitrite following beet reduced supplementation. And the lowest rise was in the trained individuals. Moreover, they actually had a um, constant load exercise, so a submaximal exercise economy task, as well as a three kilometer time trial performance. And what they found was that the oxygen reduction, so the improvement in exercise economy was only present in the low and moderately trained individuals, no effect in the highly trained individuals. Same things for improvements in three kilometer time trial performance. So again, this kind of chalks it all up to that Trained individuals may not, and typically across the literature, do not respond to beet reduce. It's only beneficial for individuals who are sedentary or recreationally active. Potential mechanisms behind this is that trained individuals have naturally higher circulating nitrate and nitrite concentrations. So that might kind of downplay the potential effects we see with exogenous supplementation. And trained individuals have greater contractile efficiency as is due to obviously the training adaptations, which might minimize any effect we see with beet reduced supplementation. So again, trained individuals do not see a benefit with beet reduced supplementation. It only benefits sedentary and recreationally active individuals, which is pretty cool. And now we can think about uh, beet reduced and females. So we know that recreationally active and sedentary individuals in men see a benefit with beet reduced supplementation. What about women? So this study looked at 12 recreationally active females. They did both acute and chronic supplementation with beet reduce or a placebo. And the figure on the left, left most, shows us uh, that acute and chronic beet reduced supplementation significantly increased plasma, nitrate, and nitrite. Perfect, we have the potential to elicit an ergogenic effect. What they then did was put the participants through the submaximal exercise economy tasks, so 50% and 70% of their peak oxygen uptake or their maximal effort. And what they found was that there's absolutely no difference between beet reduced placebo acute chronic in terms of submaximal exercise economy and not shown, but performance as well. So Perhaps there's a sex difference here. It seems that men who are recreationally active respond to beet reduced supplementation, but women who are recreationally active may not see the same benefit. Some potential things behind this maybe is that women tend to have higher circulating nitrate and nitrite naturally, so maybe they are less likely to respond to beet reduced supplementation, but really this remains to be investigated further. So one of the last ergogenics I want to talk about is pyruvate supplementation. Um, what is pyruvate? You guys know it is a glycolytic end product um, where we know through aerobic glycolysis, we get acetyl-CoA formation to go through uh, the Krebs cycle and the TCA cycle, or sorry, through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. And anaerobic glycolysis, we're thinking about lactate formation. Importantly, Pyruvate has also been purported as a weight loss agent and an ergogenic aid. So some of the literature out there in rodents suggests that pyruvate might facilitate weight loss through reduced food intake, increased energy expenditure, 
increased fat oxidation or increased thyroxin. Uh, importantly, we haven't talked about this, but basically it increased uh, increases thyroid hormone, which stimulates metabolic rate or increases metabolic rate. So the first thing I want to look at is a rodent study on energy expenditure. So everything I've kind of showed you up until this point is um, sunshine and rainbows in terms of ergogenic aids that work. But I think it's important to appreciate that maybe not all ergogenic aids are um, going to be beneficial. There's definitely stuff out there that has science behind it, but maybe it's not the greatest. So what this study shows is that male spread golly rats, and they want to show us that pyruvate supplementation, which is the experimental diet, increases energy expenditure. So you'll see that on the first red box, our uh, energy expenditure is significantly higher in the experimental diet group. That's cool. But you guys know from the first half of this course that in order to calculate energy expenditure, we need to factor in the respiratory exchange ratio or the respiratory quotient, which doesn't change in the study. So it's very interesting that the RER doesn't change, but their energy expenditure changes dramatically doesn't really add up. Second, what they saw was a statistically significant increase in thyroxin, which is T4. But what's important to note is that um, triiodothyronine, or T3, is the metabolically active form of thyroxin. If it's the metabolically active form, that means it's the form that increases energy expenditure. So yes, they saw an increase in T4, but if we look at T3, that metabolically active form, there's no significant difference and there's no real difference at all between the group that consumed um, pyruvate and the group that consumed a control diet. Moreover, uh, we know that pyruvate might influence um, body weight or weight loss through food intake. So what this study did was looked at obese Zucker rats. And what they did was they compared the group that consumed pyruvate or pyruvate plus DHA to an ad libitum group. And what they found was that there was reduced food intake with supplementation. Importantly, and kind of fun, pyruvate smells like Oreos, which is awesome, but it doesn't taste like Oreos. It actually tastes pretty bad. So it's possible that the pyruvate supplementation actually just caused food aversion to these rats and they didn't they ate less because they thought it was gross. Moreover, this diet contained 10% of the kilocalories from DHA pyruvate or the combination. If we extrapolate that to humans, uh, that's about 250 kilocalories or more than 60 grams of pyruvate per day. That is an absolutely massive dose and not really feasible for an ergogenic you're supposed to consume kind of on the side or a supplement you're supposed to consume on the side of a regular meal. So again, touching back to this idea of energy expenditure, more rodent work, same study. What they found was that uh, VO2 and energy expenditure, remember that uh, we calculate energy expenditure using VO2 RER and the amount of time that's of interest to calculate energy expenditure, energy expenditure and VO2 were increased in these rodents, which is really great. And they also found that in the second kind of box there, that fat oxidation was also increased. So this seems like a solid piece of evidence that the pyruvate supplementation might be benefiting in terms of weight loss or as it relates to energy expenditure. However, something they also found that they don't really touch on is the idea that liver triglycerides significantly increased with pyruvate supplementation. That's a terrible thing, a bad thing in terms of health for these animals and translationally health to humans. Um, probably something you don't want to consider if you're going to take pyruvate supplementation. Another angle that we can explore in terms of pyruvate as a tool to increase energy expenditure 
is through something called futile cycling. A futile cycle is a cycle that expends energy or ATP. If we're kind of wasting ATP with no functional purpose, we're increasing energy expenditure. So really what this is, is that um, the muscle pyruvate increases in excess of what pyruvate dehydrogenase can convert to acetyl-CoA. So looking at this figure, if we can't convert that pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, it's going to th go through what's called futile cycling. So that pyruvate is going to form oxaloacetate, and then that oxaloacetate is going to form phospholinoperide pyruvate, which can be converted back to pyruvate potentially to acetyl-CoA, but a pet again, potentially through to oxaloacetate and continuing in this cycle that's futile. What's important to note is that we require ATP um, that should say at pyruvate to oxaloacetate. So pyruvate to oxaloacetate generates or requires ATP, meaning that it could be a potential place for this futile cycling to occur. So now everything I've kind of showed you up until this point is in rodents. It's important that I show you some data in humans as well. So pyruvate supplementation and weight loss in humans. This study looked at 13 obese women. They put them on a 21 day diet, looking at, um, it was a 500 kilocalorie liquid diet. So that's a significant reduction in the number of calories consumed. But in complement to this, they also provided one group with DHA and pyruvate, 25 grams of that pyruvate specifically, or the other group was given a placebo. So important to note, both groups are going to lose weight because a 500 calorie liquid diet is pretty aggressive in terms of calorie restriction. We're really looking at whether the pyruvate group lost more weight because of its potential weight loss effects. What we see is that according to the study and potentially a good thing in support of pyruvate is that Weight loss was significantly greater in the pyruvate or DHAP, so DHA and pyruvate supplemented group, and it looks like they lost more fat as well. But we need to think about this practically again. Is this really feasible in regards to the idea that they're taking 25 grams of pyruvate? Most of the time, if you go to a supplement store, pyruvate is supplied as one gram capsules. So taking 25 loads a day, is that reasonable? And the other thing to consider is that I haven't shown you guys, but the literature out there that suggests and looks at low doses of pyruvate that are more feasible shows no effect. So something I want to show you guys here, and back to our idea of what we always think about with ergogenics, is our reality check. So this is a study from before in rodents where they purported increases in energy expenditure of pyruvate supplementation. Funnily enough, this study, even though it supports uh, beneficial effects of pyruvate, it's showing that pyruvate doesn't even accumulate in the blood. There's no significant difference between treatment groups for pyruvate in the blood. If the supplement does not increase in the blood, how can it even reach our target tissue to elicit these effects? So here's a study in humans looking at pyruvate in the blood. They took 7, 15, or 25 grams of pyruvate. I don't need to explain which groups are which because there's no evidence it actually gets in the blood. There's no change from baseline, so time zero to 240 minutes post-ingestion. If our supplement doesn't get into the blood, do you guys think it would affect athletic performance? Probably not, I'm hoping is the answer. So this study, kind of nail in the coffin, seven well-trained male cyclists, what they did was they supplemented with pyruvate for a week, and this was seven grams a day, so a moderate dose. What they did was they cycled at a moderate to high intensity until exhaustion, so 75 to 80% of their VO2 max, and they found that pyruvate supplementation had no effect on time trial performance or their ability to ride to exhaustion. So perhaps not all ergogenics are beneficial, so it doesn't look like pyruvate is really going to help us. 
And the last thing I want to talk about with this lecture is something that's not so much related to skeletal muscle, but kind of something I find interesting. And that's carbohydrate malfrancing. This is a novel ergogenic aid. So we know that ingesting carbohydrates is important for sustained long duration, moderate intensity efforts because we rely heavily on blood glucose and muscle glycogen for fuel. But what carbohydrate mouth rinsing really is, it's involving literally taking a sports drink or something with simple sugars in it, swishing it around your mouth for five to 10 seconds like you would mouthwash, and then spitting it out. You're not actually drinking it at all. The idea is that the sugars, the carbohydrates in the drink, what they actually do is they stimulate the central nervous system to improve performance. How exactly does that happen? Well, the mechanism of action is actually pretty interesting. So when you're swishing that drink around your mouth, there's actually receptors in the mouth that can detect sweetness and send that signal to your brain. Stimulation of those receptors specifically activate regions in the brain associated with reward, motivation, and actually even motor control. So what this can do is actually just simply swishing around a carbohydrate drink in your mouth can make you work harder, have a decreased perception of effort or fatigue, and basically make you perform better. And how they actually determine this is through a technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. What they can see is that following this mouth rinse or during this mouth rinse, they can actually track which areas of the brain light up in response to this mouth rinsing, and they can correlate those regions of the brain track them back to what their functions are, and again, it's reward, motivation, and motor control. So does mouth rinsing actually improve performance? Of course, this is our important metric. We've showed that it has an impact, but does it translate to a functional improvement? 12 recreationally active males, they were asked to complete a set amount of work as fast as possible, and they are provided with a mouth rinse for every 12.5% of the time trial they completed. So first condition was a placebo, second condition was 6% carbohydrate mouth rinse, the other one was a 16% carbohydrate mouth rinse. So they wanted to see if the concentration of um, sugar or carbohydrate in the drink influenced performance in any kind of graded manner. What they found was that time trial performance in the 6% and the 16% carbohydrate solution groups was significantly improved compared to the placebo, with no difference really between the two. So that means that if we look at the figure, it took them less time to do the same amount of work, and because they put out more powers, meaning they could complete that work faster. What's even cooler about that is that heart rate and their rating of perceived exertion was not different um, compared to the placebo. So they actually, physiologically through heart rate, and psychologically, through perceived exertion, thought that they were working just as hard, even though they performed faster and more uh, power to achieve that faster time with the carbohydrate mouth rinsing. So that's all for this week, guys. Um, aging presentations. I've spoken to you guys about our Skype meetings. Um, everyone else, stay tuned for the paper summaries that will come. And next week, we'll have an online lecture regarding environmental stress. And that will be the wrap up for the content this semester.